one of the reasons me and Daniel have been talking about this message is I typically only read gospel news related, uh, gospel coalitions, one of my favorite news threads, uh, very, very progressive from a perspective of not choosing denominational size, but just looking at the whole of Christianity. Uh, and they did a study recently in which 50% of all believers do not believe that Jesus is actually God. This is in America, across all denominations. They don't believe that he is holy God. That is scary. So, come on down, Daniel. Okay, and the kids, all the kids, come with me. We're going to go to this room right here, okay? I know what to do. <laughs> I know what to do. I'm every and you eat crackers. Right. There's this crackers song? in the room, yeah. okay? This song? I'm live. Hope you have me up there. Can you notice, please? <clears throat> Is it buzzing? Buzzing? Yeah. yeah. I just did turn you. It did. It turned it off. <laughs> oh, I can talk loud. Uh oh. What did I do? Well, we need the mic. You gotta put the mic. You have to switch it back to this computer anyway. Oh, you're right. I, I can do that. So, me and my wife are not very talented with. Uh, we've been doing street ministry for many, many years. This is more technology than we've ever had in our ministry, so <laughs> be patient. <laughs> Not in your job. Oh, there we go. All right, here we go. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, my name's Daniel, and um, I'm thankful for each of you that are here, and especially family and friends. And, um, oh, hey, Ryan. <laughs> Hanging out in the corner. Um, whenever I first came here to work uh, two plus years ago, and I, and I walked over to this area of, of the building, and I looked at this bleachers, and I said, somebody's going to plant a church here. And last fall, in walks Jabbar, and he's talking to the staff here about, like, his, his vision for the space and his vision for the ministry. And I come over here him and I'm like, I need to get to know this guy. And uh, praise God, I went over and met Jabbar and was, um, I was fortunate to get to see him here at Work Hub. Really often we get to have conversations and my, my boss keeps threatening me that I'm not working hard. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I have to make up for it. <laughs> But um, anyway, I just, and I've been blessed to be able to come here a few times during this, you know, kind of quarantine season that we're in, and I've just been blessed by uh, each of you that I've met, and um, Jabbar, you know, often encourages me that I'm a, he thinks I'm a good teacher, but yet he hasn't heard me teach. He just <laughs> kind of goes off the conversations we have here, and um Anyway, he asked me a couple weeks ago if I would consider teaching soon, and I said, sure. And I said, well, what are you going through? Like, what topics are we talking about? And he said, well, you know, just whatever the Spirit leads, but a lot of questions are coming up about the Trinity, and uh, I, he just felt like he needed somebody who's more of a teacher to, uh, to talk through it. And I said, okay, sure, let's give it a shot. <laughs> And so I, I am, um, my, my bent, my orientate, my, my gifting is in teaching and as a teacher and as a, if you know personality types, I'm a C or a analytical person. And yeah, uh, and so I like things to be organized and so it's hard for me to talk about something so big without having a, like an organization. So then, hence the PowerPoint, and hopefully uh, everybody can follow along. And most of it is the passages that we'll be going through, so we don't have to keep flipping, because there's a lot of scripture involved with the Trinity. It is not something that you can just dig, okay, one passage and that's it. You know, it's, it's, it's the whole gamut of scripture that teaches the truth about God's nature. And so God's revealing himself through scripture, it takes a lot to do it. 
because he's big and complicated. Um, anyway, I uh, also I just, just want to ask you to pray for me because this is a big topic and it's not a simple thing to come to talk through. So uh, pray that I mean I have this organized thing that, um, but I, you know just that the Spirit would lead and that I would be bound to this. Um, and I invite each of you to participate. This will be a little interactive. Are you all okay with that? Everybody's good? Yeah. All right. Michael, you're good up there? Okay. So uh, let me pray, and then we'll get started. Um, <clears throat> Lord God, I, I'm humbled before you, uh, and knowing that you are good and holy and righteous and um, all-powerful, God, and we know that that uh, you desire to, you know us through and through and you desire for us to know you to be in relationship with you to um and to honor and glorify you lord i thank you that we can know you through your son who came here uh, to show us the father to teach us about the kingdom to die uh, on our behalf and to give, forgive us of our sins so that we can be um, redeemed and that we can know you. Lord, I, um, I pray that you would guide this time by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you speak through your word, that you open our hearts and our minds to what you want to teach, and Lord, that you would be honored and glorified through this time. Um, God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I left my cup over here. <clears throat> All right. Uh, any note takers in the room? Yeah. I, I have some handouts that I was going to wait and give out, but I could go ahead and... Oh, these are stapled. Look at that. Wow. Uh, it, this is... Um, this is pretty heavy for you to just start reading. <laughs> it includes some some creeds from the old church, uh, the three and four hundreds early church, and then it has a doctrinal statement that I wrote, um, what I believe about God. And so, but you can use the back for notes. So anyway, Mark can help help uh, pass that out. <clears throat> and if you need a pen. They don't have them over here. They're over there. Eric can get them for you. He can throw them at you. Uh, anyway, all right. Well, uh, again, I, my name is Daniel, and I, my wife is up there, and her parents were in town already, so they tagged along. So thank you, Jane and John, for coming. And my three children are in the room over there, uh, Joshua, Caleb, and... Catherine are our delight. Um, so, I have this handy dandy slides here. Um, God is holy above all. I, I, as I read scripture, I see the holiness of God as being uh, central to his character, to his nature. And I'm, I'm glad Janelle picked out great songs, whoever picked out songs um, for this morning. There was a lot of focus on God being holy. And um, there's this great hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Um, this comes from Revelation, well, from several chapters in the Bible, but... Revelation chapter 4, where uh, John is given a vision of the throne room of God, and he's experiencing the majesty of God and um, the, the angels around him. And verse, so Revelation 4, 8, it says, The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Um, and I, I start here because I want us to remember that 
ultimately God is holy. He is beyond us, beyond our understanding, and he is um, there. He created us in him as his image, but there is a separation between us and him in the sense of like he is set apart and we don't control him. We don't manipulate him. We don't change him in any way. And he only he can reveal himself to us, right? And we don't know him without him revealing himself to us. So I just wanted to start there. Um, one of the first times we see a clear picture of, of the Trinity is at the baptism of Jesus. Uh, there's clues of it in the Old Testament, and we'll talk about that. But the baptism of Jesus, we get this scene where Jesus is baptized, and we have this um, in Matthew 3. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. In this same scene, we have the Father, Son, and the Spirit represented. And not something that is recorded clearly in Scripture yet. This is the first, like the first time that we see the Father, Son, and the Spirit clearly demonstrated. You can see it in Genesis 1, but it's not as clear as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All at this pivotal moment in history, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ here on earth, and uh, declaring the, the, the divinity of Christ and... Uh, just the triune God represented right there all, all together. Um, at the end, so that was the beginning of his ministry, the very end of his ministry here on earth, Jesus said this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus here is um, he's, he's saying that the name, the name, not names, the name, it's, it's a singular. And if you know, if you've read the Old Testament, uh, God over and over again it emphasizes the importance of his name, the holiness of his name. You uphold his name. You do not take his name in vain. And here Jesus is saying the name of God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um. And then in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, this is the very last verse of 2 Corinthians, Paul, Paul closes with this line. He says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So we, we have these, these times in the Bible where we have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, and yet, uh, as, we'll, as we'll go through, and we'll continue in this, we know that there's only one God. Right? Um, and so that brings up a lot of questions. Right? How, how, is there, how is there only one God, but yet we see these three persons that are distinct, they're unique, they're, they appear at different times, but yet sometimes all at the same time. It, you know, in Jesus, he prays to the Father. So obviously there's a distinction. Uh, Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's not saying I'm sending myself as the Holy Spirit. He's saying I'm sending the Holy Spirit. It's another person. Okay, so now I hear some interaction. What... What questions would you, do you have about the Trinity? I'm not saying I'm going to answer all of them right now. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, go ahead. I was listening to Jesse Duplantis a couple of days ago, and he was giving his testimony about uh, having seen heaven. Oh, okay. But one of the things that struck me that really tied into my questions about the Trinity was um, as, as he had had understood it was that the Father was the mind of God, Jesus is the face of God, and the Holy Spirit is the voice of God. Okay. I don't know. It yeah. was just something to kind of put out there. Okay, it, it stuck with me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a... 
I'm not going to say that I would disagree with that. So yeah, but no, thank you for that. Um, any anybody else? Any questions or comments? From off the bat, yep. Yeah. Yeah, there's different views on the Trinity, and we'll hopefully maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Um, or different, sorry, different views on the nature of God. I'll put it that way. Uh, yeah. Anyway, okay. Well, everybody's clear on the Trinity, so maybe we can just skip this whole thing. No. Uh, okay. But um, here, here's a list of questions that people might have. Just for instance. Uh, is the Trinity essential? Do you have to believe the Trinity? Do you have to fully understand it? Is it essential? Uh, has this God always been triune? Or is this something that like happened later? Uh, you know, is, is this always been true? Right? We, or did God create the Trinity? Right? Was there the Father and then he created the Trinity? This is kind of what Mormons believe. I don't know if you, anybody interact with Mormons very much, but that's kind of what they believe, is that uh, the Father created the Son and the Spirit. So the Father came first and created the, Father, the Son and the Spirit, and so therefore creating the Trinity, as they call it. Um, if Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father, then how could God have always been three in one? How does that work? I'm not going to answer all these today, but I'm just going to leave you in mystery. Anyway, um, how can we trust the doctrine of the Trinity since the Bible does not use the word Trinity? Right? If the, if the word's not in there, how can we believe that it's a biblical word? Right? Okay. Uh, and how did the belief in the Trinity begin? How, where, where did this come from, Right? And, and was this like superimposed by Roman oppression or something, or by Greek uh, philosophy, or is this something that is that we should believe is true? Um, what are the questions? We did that before we did all these. So, all right. But I wanted to read this. Now I know that like reading from a slide is not always exciting. I love this quote, and I just felt like sharing it with you. Yes, you have a question or something. No, no, okay. So the hand, that that includes um, that's not a that's not a worksheet thing. That's like a supplemental read it later kind of deal. Can you go back one second so I take Oh you wanna take it okay, go ahead. <clears throat> you got it. Awesome. Okay. All right, so this book, uh, actually I have it on my desk over there, but um, I'll, I'll read this to you. This is the only time I'm going to like read from like a section of a book, I promise, except for the Bible. Um, Studying the Trinity is a chance to taste and see that the Lord is good, to have your heart won and yourself refreshed. For it is only when you grasp what it means for God to be a trinity that you really sense the beauty, the overflowing kindness, the heart-grabbing loveliness of God. If the trinity were something we could shave off God, then we would not be relieving him of some irksome weight. We would be shearing him of precisely what is so delightful about him. For God is triune, and it is as triune that he is so good and desirable. That's from delighting in the Trinity. Um, so a couple things from this is, uh, well, one thing just to, just to make sure that you understand, the word triune is the words Trinity and unity put together. Trinity and unity. Triune. Got it? Okay. So that's not confusing. And then um, th there's this kind of understanding of like, oh, Trinity, that's some weighty doctrine that, you know, that Christians, some people believe and it's boring <laughs> but if, if it's the nature of God, if this is who the, the God that is, the God that created you and me and this whole universe, if this is his nature, 
then it's not some boring like doctrine. It's who he is, right? And it's just our like grappling with trying to figure out the nature of God and better understand him. So, so that's his point, is saying you're not, we're not, if we're tossing out the Trinity as a doctrine, it's not like throwing off some heavy theological term. It is throwing out who he is, you know? It's like, well, I don't really care to understand God. But um, it, there's a lot of beauty in understanding and kind of talking through the Trinity. Anyway, well, that's where we're going. Where we're headed. Is this clear enough of an outline? You got it? How, what, how, and so what? All right, I have an explanation. <laughs> uh, so how? How can we know or understand God's nature? How can we? And uh, what does the Bible say on the Trinity? We're going to look at not everything the Bible says, but some of it. Uh, how did we get, or how did we develop this belief? The, the Jews before Jesus didn't believe in the Trinity. They still don't. And uh, so how do we get there? Right? If we started from Judaism, how do we get to the Trinity? And then, uh, so what? So what does it matter? What difference does it make? What, what changes in my life if I understand or believe the Trinity? Austin, what do you think? Sorry, I put you on the spot. So, <laughs> so what? Okay. So, um, we, we, some of the, uh, the song, the guy that was, that was talking, reading scripture, praying um, during the worship video, he, he hit on this quite a bit, is the fact that God is mystery. God is, um, here in this verse, unsearchable. Uh, so, so there is this understanding that God is kind of beyond us. He's beyond our understanding. We cannot fully understand God, right? Um, but he's awesome. He's good. He's greatly to be praised. Uh, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. This is psalmist, I think David, just basically saying, like, oh, it's just too much. I can't get it. I, and that's a good thing, right? If we fully understood God, then he wouldn't be so great. Right? Um, Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Oh, this is God speaking. So my is God. Right? And your is us. My thoughts is not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Uh, here God is saying, like, you don't have my mind. Right? You, you glad about that, Sean? Yeah, me too. And um, <laughs> let God be God. And, and, and understanding that his thoughts are beyond us. His understanding is beyond us. And we have to be okay with that and understand we're not going to completely understand God. And that's okay. Um, but the glorious truth about us as, his, as humanity is, is this. So can I have a reader? I was going to have somebody wants to read loudly. <laughs> Julie, you can read loudly. All right. This one. <laughs> then God said, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created mankind in his own image, and the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. All right, real briefly, I want you to turn to your neighbor and ask them, ask each other, what, what does this passage say that is true about us? I'll do that real quick. One minute. All right, all right, that was about a minute. Uh, any, any thoughts? What, what does this say that's true about us as his humanity? Here in Genesis 1, the very beginning of the creation of humanity. We're created in his image. 
Creating his image, right? You know, I kind of put the answers down here. Um, but uh, creating his image. What does that mean that we're creating his image? Are we just like him? We're supposed to be. Okay. Just like him. Okay. What, is, what else does it mean that we're creating his image? What do images do? A mirror. They mirror, they image, right? So image is image. And so our job as images is to image God, to reflect him, to mirror him, right? Yeah. To who? To the creation, to the world, right? And he also, what is something else that this says that's true about us? Yes. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, the word steward there. I realized that after I asked the question, like, oh, I kind of put that there. Um, yeah, he gave us a responsibility. He says, you're going to be my images, image bearers on earth, and you have a responsibility as my people to care for this creation that I've made, that I love, that is very good. And, uh, and so we have a responsibility to do that. Now, um, and then... And then, of course, we have the fall, and we have problems, and we have sin, and we have, you know. But then we get, at the very end of Jesus' life, right before he dies, he prays in the garden. And he, and he says this, this is eternal life, that, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So um, God has created us in his image, and our eternal destiny, our greatest purpose is to know God. Right? That's eternal life, is what Jesus is summarizing. Say, here's eternal life, knowing God, being in relationship with him. And yes, he is beyond our understanding. He is unsearchable. He is all these things. But Jesus says knowing and being in relationship with him as his image bearers is our ultimate purpose. And uh, so, so we have, are called as his image bearers to, to get to know him. Now, this is a longer verse, but it, right in the middle of it, Anyway, I'll just read it. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So God is saying here, even in Jeremiah, that uh, that it's that the what's best to know and to brag about is that you know God that that that's like I am in relationship with Him and I'm getting to know Him, and so He's not He He is knowable in a way that He has revealed Himself. So He has revealed Himself through Scripture, and through His Son and through the Holy Spirit, and so um, we can. We can get to know him in that way. We can uh, discover things that he has revealed about himself. So, um, oh, this one, yes. So, uh, what I want you to do is turn to your neighbor and say, within the next hour or 30 minutes or however long, uh, I will better understand God. Okay. You got it, Ryan? Okay. <laughs> I think we kind of, we get the idea of like the Trinity and we get cloudy eyes and we think, oh, I can't understand this. I'm just going to write it off. I'm hopeless. I can't understand. Yes, you can. Because God has created you as his image bearer and he is revealing himself to you through the spirit and through your word, through his word. And, and he wants us to know him. Right? Okay. So now we're going to dive in. So, uh, as one thing that is abundantly clear in the Old Testament is there's only one God, right? If you read the Old Testament, you see it over and over. I mean, all throughout Scripture, there's only one God. And uh, there's these two, well, the, Deuteronomy 6.4 is, is called the Shema. And this is something that the Jews, like they, or the Israelites, prayed all the time. And it was just a central passage to their identity and their belief system. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Right? That's pretty clear. Yeah? And then Isaiah 44, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, 
and there is no God besides me. There's one, one God, no God besides him. Uh, no, let me get a little bit philosophical for a second. Hang with me. Um, is it possible for there to be two ultimate perfect beings in the universe? Is it possible? Okay, yeah. Any thoughts? So, I don't think, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's an argument for it, but I don't think it's possible for there to be two ultimately perfect beings because if there was two, then there's something lacking or different in each of them. Does that make sense? And so there's, there can only be one ultimate, all-powerful, all-perfect being that is eternal and perfect in everything, right? And so, um, anyway, that we could talk about that for days. But uh, I just wanted to say that there is... A lot of argument for there can only be one ultimately one God um, okay sorry I'm going backwards but Jesus did things that only God could do what, what are some things that Jesus did that only God could or would do Heal. okay he he raised people from the dead he healed Okay, well, let's talk about the mirac miracles and healings first. So, he, he performed these miraculous healings. Do you, the fact that he healed people or brought people back from the dead, does that prove that he's divine? No, why not? Right, you see uh, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Peter, Paul others do performing miracles, right? The Holy Spirit working through those people. So the fact that Jesus performed miracles does not prove that he's divine. But how he did it shows a pretty good evidence that he is. Why? Because he was doing it in his own name, in his own power, out of his own will, and just whenever he wanted to, right? You get the sense from Peter and Paul that, I mean, they could do it, but it was always like, okay, if the Lord wills, I'm praying, Right? And Jesus would just heal. And sometimes without even doing anything, the lady just touches his garment and then he's, he's healed. Right? So the way he did it and the fact that he accepted praise for doing these things. Right? Jesus accepted praise, which nobody else does. Right? Peter, whenever he heals somebody and they start praising him, he's like, whoa, I'm just a dude. Don't praise me. This is through <coughs> Jesus, not me. Um, all right. So, and... I don't know why I had these twice. Anyway, oh, miracles. So there's healings, but then there's like, what other miracles? The feeding of 5,000, walking on water. Yeah, turning the water, or yeah, the water to wine. Cool things that he did, and in themselves don't prove it, but the fact that like the way he did it and the way he accepted the worship and the praise of these things shows this guy is more than just another prophet. Um, the transfiguration. What happens at the transfiguration? Jesus goes on a mountain with the, the okay, yeah, he, he's like glory, he's shown in, in this, he's bright white glowing, and then Moses and Elijah are there, and they're just having a conversation about what Jesus is going to do in the kingdom of God and all of that, and Peter's kind of like, hey, I can build some tents, um, and then, uh, <laughs> thanks Peter, uh, but yeah, so there's this moment, and that's like, this, and then you hear God's voice in the middle of it. Um, that's not something that normally happens to people, right? And so that is something that, and then it's, and then it's, it's more of like how Jesus reacts through that, is that he is acting in a way that only God would act if, in, the, in these moments. Um, the resurrection, right? <laughs> Nobody else has, other people have been resuscitated, Right? You have Lazarus and you have other stories of people who have died and they're resuscitated. Right? But nobody's gone through death and then come out with a resurrected body. Uh, and we see that in Jesus, the fact that he, you know, he appears through walls. He does things in his resurrected body that us don't, that we don't do. Right? Lazarus died again. Right? The people who were raised from dead died again. Jesus didn't die again. And then the ascension. Yeah, like Elijah ascended, but he needed help. 
something happened to Enoch, and we're not sure. He walked, and then he was with God. But Jesus ascended, like, and that was clear. He said, I'm going to go back to the Father. And then, there he goes. And, uh, and so the, these things that Jesus does that say, man, this guy is not just an average prophet or teacher or rabbi. There's a lot more to him. And, and, it, and it gave the, the, the disciples who come from a belief that there's only one God, and they're saying, this guy, Jesus, there's a lot more to him than, what, um, than him just being a regular prophet. So it's stirring their minds and their hearts to the idea that, wait, Jesus must be divine. <clears throat> Um, and he said a lot of things that only God would say. Uh, what? Sorry, before I show them, what are some things Jesus said that only God would say or could say? Your sins are forgiven, right? I can't say that, right? Uh, and, and, and there's a time whenever Jesus says that and the Pharisees say, whoa. You're making yourself equal to God. They got it. They understood. Wait, you don't do that. What else did he say? The the one that I'm about to pull up. I'll I'll, I'll show it. <laughs> Eric, this is this is hanging you in mystery before I give you all the answers, right? So what do you think? What did what did uh, Jesus say that he that only God would say? Right. He covered that. Okay, that was something he did, right? He would touch um, because he, usually the infection would go from the lepers to the person touching them. But in Jesus' case, it was a, like a good infection going from him to them, right? Yeah, so in Luke 4, he quotes from Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 3-ish. And the Pharisees tried to stone him because they said, that's blasphemous. You're claiming Yeah, they're trying to run him off a cliff, and then he just mysteriously walks through them, and off he goes. Yeah. Yeah, and there's other times whenever they, like, pick up stones to stone him, and he just kind of disappears or walks away, right? Because it wasn't his time, and God was in control. And you just, you see that over and over again. But thank you. Okay, so here's some, some times. And in Matthew 19, 29, he says this, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake, my name's sake, will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. This is a bold claim if he's not God. If he's not God, he right here is being blasphemous. Right? Saying if you if you forsake everything for me, for my name, not God's name, not Elohim, Yahweh's name, my name, you'll receive an inherit eternal life. Right? You don't say that unless you actually are divine. Uh, Luke 7, this you, you mentioned it, yeah, your faith has saved you, go in peace, right? He knows that this the, the person's faith has saved them. Not just that they're healed, but their faith has saved them. Right? I mean, a prophet could maybe know that, but I don't know. He's kind of, he's getting heretical if he's not divine. John 6, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Right? You, you don't say this unless you're divine. And he's calling God Father. This is something that the Jews didn't do. Right? The Jews didn't call, refer to God as Father. There's a few instances in the Old Testament where God is seen as Father, but they didn't do that. And so here Jesus is like regularly referring to God as Father, showing a relationship with the Father that this was forbidden and unknown by those people. Um, John 10, I and the Father are one. The Father is in me and I and the Father. You don't, you don't see that being said by anybody because it would be heretical unless it's true. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, somewhere in there, some of the Pharisees say, wait, you're going to die for this. Yeah. Um, 
Matthew 26. Okay, so this is a big one. This is one where Jesus is, um, he's in his trial, okay? And he's being questioned by a lot of people. And no good answers, no good questions, no good accusations are coming forward. So then the chief priest says, all right, tell us straightforward, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says this, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. In this passage, Jesus quotes from Daniel 7 and Psalm 110, two clearly messianic passages. Like any of the Jews would have recognized, these both are messianic passages. He's combining them and saying, like, that's me. And he's raising his status. He's saying, I I'll do you one more. You call me Messiah. I'm saying, I am this guy. I am the Son of Man. I am the one at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. This is me. And then right after that, the chief priest tears his robes and says, this is blasphemy. You're going to die. And which, if he's not divine, that's the right thing to do. But he is, right? We believe he is. Um, in Matthew 28, it's a right part of the Great Commission. Jesus says this, all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. All authority is given to me. Again, Ryan, would you say this if you weren't divine? No, no, he shook his head. Okay, good. Um, okay, so, so these are all the things that Jesus said, and we talked about things he did. Not all the things, just, of course there's more. Um, so after Jesus rose, uh, ascended to heaven, um, well, actually one of these is uh, before that. Uh, the, 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 the early Christians are trying to wrestle with, like, okay, what does this mean? Right? We believe in one God, but yet Jesus did and he said things that, uh, that demonstrate his divinity. What do we believe? What, is, what do we do with this? Okay? Um, and so in John 20, this is, before he, this is after his resurrection, Jesus appears uh, to him and he, Thomas declares, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Right? Jesus accepts this title, my Lord and my God. He accepts it. And he says, good, Thomas, that you've believed. A lot of people will believe that don't see me, have not seen me. And, uh, and that's us, right? Praise God. That we can believe even though we haven't seen him in the flesh like Thomas got to. Um, okay. And then in Acts 2. So, uh, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, at the beginning of chapter of Acts 2, the Pentecost, and they're all the everybody's preaching, and then all these people are coming, and then Peter gets says, Hey, let me give a speech. So he gives his first sermon. And and he says this about Jesus. God raised up, and and of that we are all sorry, this Jesus, God raised up, of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Um, he, he's, he's pointing, saying this, God has validated this man by raising him. And he's declaring and, and putting him at the right hand of Father. So like in the seat of power, seat of authority. Jesus, you crucified him. God has vindicated, has, has, has approved him, and demonstrating that he is divine. Um, I feel like I'm getting... Somebody need to stand up and dance a little bit? No? We're good? All right. Sean can lead us in the... No? Ah, oh, all right. It's not going to happen. Okay. Okay, <clears> then <throat> they said a lot of other things. So this is at the beginning of John, but this is like John reflecting. He, he, starts, he starts his book with this declaration of truth about Jesus and his divinity. And, um, but this, of course, is written way after Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven. And, uh, and so he begins with this strong declaration of who Jesus is. And the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. 
And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. A super strong declaration of the divinity of Jesus. He is God. He was God. He was there at the creation. I mean, you know, it's hard to read this and not understand. Jesus is divine. He is the Word. Um, Colossians chapter 1, I, I could have included the whole chapter almost. But here's a verse from that. Uh, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And uh, Philippians 2, 9 and 10, God, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, oh, I should have said 9 through 11. Anyway, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the early Christians, Paul, Peter, Thomas, all these guys are saying, this Jesus He's not just a prophet. He's not just the Messiah. He is divine. But yet there's only one God. How do we work this out? Yes, sir. Colossians 1.15 is one of the scriptures that a lot of people use to refute their belief. The Trinity. Yeah. Because they don't believe in the Trinity. Interesting. I don't know why that would be a good verse for that. Yeah. Because the firstborn, if he was born first, then he didn't believe. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then you have John 3.16, the only begotten. Yeah. If people get hung up on that, I don't know that I have time to explain that. But um, it, it's because, well, see, God uses our language to explain divine truth, all right? And so the Scripture talks about God's hand. Well, he doesn't have a hand, right? Or God's ears. He doesn't have ears. Like, he, he uses our language to explain truths about him. And so this like, this concept of uh, firstborn or begotten. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The, uh, in that language, he says, of all creation. Uh -huh. So there is a paradigm in which God speaks, it traverses realms, if you will. Yeah. Thanks, Jabbar. Yes. That's good. Yeah, and, and there's the concept of like Jesus is continuously begotten from God. And so there never was a time when he was not begotten of God. And but yeah, that gets heavy. Anyway, so uh, in Hebrews 1 3, he's the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. This this is the idea of a um, you've probably heard this before, but the king would have a signet ring. And, um, and so they put wax on a letter, and, and then they use their signet ring, so that makes an impression. And, um, and so it, it says, this, it's an exact representation of my ring. Like, this is me, we're representing me, and this letter is from me, so it's a representation. You know, does that make sense? And so that's the concept here, is that Jesus is an exact, like, he is made of the same stuff as God. He is... God in, in the exact representation of God. Does that mean, okay? Okay. Um, and then Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, okay? So we, we established that Jesus is divine, okay? God the Father is divine, of course. I don't think I have to prove that. And then, and then there's just so much evidence that Jesus is divine. He's either, he is either divine, he's either Lord or he's crazy, or he's a an evil liar, right? And he deserved to die. Um, and and well, then there's some some people would say he's a legend, but uh, I think that's uh, whatever. Anyway, um, so I, I don't have time to go through all these passages. We've done through a lot already. But in John 14 through 16, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, and this is like near the end of his ministry, and he's saying. Uh, I'm sending a helper. I'm sending a counselor. I'm sending another from the Father. And, and he is the spirit of truth. 
he is going to glorify me and glorify the Father. And, and, and this, the, he's going to be another like me. Um, and, then, and then in Acts 5, the Holy Spirit is called God. All right. And then, uh, and then we talk about passages where the Holy Spirit can be grieved. So he's not just a, a force. He's not, you know, Star Wars force. Mm -hmm. it's, it, he's not just a, like a, an, an eminence of love from the Father. He is a person. Because um, Jesus says, I'm sending another like me. I'm sending a helper. It's not Jesus. It is, but he is divine and he's sending from the Father. And so, so the Holy Spirit is a person. Um, not in the sense that we are persons, but he is an individual. He is distinct and unique. All right? So here we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But yet there's one God. How do we put this together? Right? Um, so people went back to the Old Testament looking for clues. The early church, they said, okay, well, that we believe in only one God, and we believe that, but we also believe that the Father is God, the Spirit is God, the Son is God. How does this work? And is this, is this like a change? Did God change? What do you think? Did God change? No. no. He's the same God, but yet now he's revealed more of himself, Right? And so he didn't reveal everything in Genesis 1. He progressively revealed himself throughout Scripture and throughout time. And so um, they looked for, for evidence. Now, I'm sure we could go on, I could be a whole other like, series of, like, of sermons about the, the prophecies of the Messiah. Have you all read those and studied those and thought about, like, there's so many times whenever Jesus was prophesied. Um, but... I want to talk about these two verses. So, going back to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Okay, interesting thing about this word in Hebrew. So, I've got, to, got to, a little bit of Hebrew lesson here. Uh, the word one, there's two, there's two Hebrew words for the, for the word one. All right? Uh, there's a word, echad. Can you all say that with me? Echad. Sure. Got it, Micah? Echad. Sure, can I <laughs> Okay? And then Yahid. Ichad and Yahid. And uh, so the word Yahid means singular one. This is one camera. I am one person. Austin has one pair of glasses. And um, on him. <laughs> and, uh, and so Yahid is singular one. Right? Just one. But the word here in this verse is ihad. It means a plural one, okay? A unified one. Uh, we, it's so we could be one church, right? But we're not just, right, we're peop, we're, there's this unity created in it. Um, and, and a, and a, so this is also seen in Genesis 2, whenever uh, God says the, the husband and wife will leave their family and become one flesh, right? That, that's, Ichad is one flesh, is what's used in that verse. There's still two people, but they're united as one flesh, all right? So, Micah, are y'all one person or two people that are united? What do you think? <laughs> two people united. So y'all are Ichad, you're not Yahid. Okay, so the word here in Deuteronomy 6.4 demonstrates a certain amount of, like, plurality within God. Mm -hmm. He is a united plurality, okay? Follow me? So if, if, if Moses, when he wrote this, had used the word Yahid, then it would have eliminated that option. But he uses this word that gives evidence that, oh, there's some depth here. Um, something I don't have on the slide is also the, the name of God, Elohim. Elohim is a plural name of God. It's a, it's, it's a plural word. Like the name is, it kind of, it shows plurality. It show, it's like a, I don't know, it's a we word, not an I word. Okay? <laughs> if that makes sense. So, uh, so there's these clues where, um, and you see that. And then in, in, uh, in Genesis 1 where God said, let us make man in our image. Right? Who is he talking? Who's us? Who's our you know, maybe he's talking angels. I don't know. But 
we're not created in an angel's image. We're created in God's image. And so who's us? Uh, and then in, there's this interesting verse in Isaiah 48 where God's speaking and says, Now the Lord has sent me and his spirit. There's three, three persons here, right? The Lord has sent me and his spirit. Interesting. Um, Isaiah 9. Maybe Jesus is this guy. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. How is a... Uh, how is a child born that could be the father? Unless that child that was born is divine and from the father. And so, uh, the, 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 so they found, there's so many passages that demonstrate the, from the Old Testament, we could go on for hours, but we won't, <laughs> um, that demonstrate that, that, that it's not a brand new concept. It was something they just missed. There was this veil. There was this mystery. Uh, because they think, okay, God is one. He is, I believe in one God. We don't believe in three God, the three persons who are one. Um, but yet, they look back and they can see it. Uh, oh, I'm just bringing up these verses again. Where they, they have this conclusion, and Jesus demonstrates it in here in his baptism formula. Baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then we have blessings that include the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, okay, so some general things about God. God is love. I think that's something that most people understand, right? Or they know. Or they have this concept that God is love. Um, if I say, let me be blasphemous for a second. Say I'm God. And there's nothing else. So before creation, before there's anything created, I am kind of here. I exist. But yet, it's just me. Can I, can I be, would you describe me as being loving if it's just me, by myself, and there's nothing else? <laughs> right? That's not a word you would use. What do you think? No? So uh, how can, before the creation of the universe, how can a, an essential core part of God's nature be love if it's just him? Right? It has to always be true of him. If it's, if it's essential to who he is, it has to always be true before he created. And that can only be true if there's a community, if there are persons to love. There is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit who are eternally loving each other. Right? And so God can be love because he is triune. Does that make sense? And because he is love, and then he can create beings that he loves. Praise the Lord that he loves us. And, uh, and desire to redeem and to be in relationship with. And so out of his nature as being the Trinity, we see that it's essential for him to be, or that the concept of him being loving is essential for the Trinity. Or the Trinity is, you know, so um, in something interesting about Islam is that they believe in a singular monotheistic God. They don't, they, the, the Trinity is heresy to them. And, and so they don't use the term love, or the name love about God. They know there's a lot of names of God in the Quran, but love is not one of them. And because and so, and they can't really believe that God is love. Because he couldn't have loved before he created. Uh, interesting major difference between us and them. Okay. So why can't he love before he created? Well, That's not a true thing. No, no. Explain your, your question. You said God can't love until he creates. If it's only him. Right, that's not true. God is love. So God is loving. Right. Before he creates or after he creates, there's right. still love. Because he's triune. Right. Because he's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they love each other. So there's, there's a love between in the, in the relationship of the, the God. Mm -hmm. 
there is love. But if it's only the Father, or only God, he wouldn't be a father. But if there's only God, like Allah, so in, 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 Quran, in, the, in, in Islam, they believe in Allah is one, singular one. They would use the word Yahid, not Ihai. God is singular one, and so therefore he cannot love before he creates anything, because it's just him. It has to be an object. Then it would just be self-love, and then that's not a thing that we like celebrate. Yes, sir. All right. I thought I would last long enough. Okay. All right. Um, th there's also this concept, I mean, related to what we just talked about with God being love. This idea that God is always... Um, the, the three persons of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, are always glorifying each other, all right? And so um, the Father glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father, the Spirit glorifies. They're always glorifying each other, okay? Which demonstrates humility. It demonstrates, like, deflection of glory. So, Austin, if you glorify God... God the Father, and then God the Father says, yeah, look at, look at my son. Look at my son. He is amazing. Look what he's done. Look at how much I love him and how much he loves you, right? And if you, if you honor, glorify the son, the son will point to the father and say, yeah, my, my dad is so good. God is so good. And so they're, they're glorifying each other. There is a deflection that shows humility and it shows love. It shows um, just uh, this awesome community within the Godhead. And um, it, it's shown here in this verse, and, I, I, and I'm realizing like we've read a lot. So read, read John 17, please. And, um, and in John 17, verses 1 through 5, Jesus, and especially the whole, the whole chapter, he's just over and over again demonstrating like, I glorify the Father, you glorify me. We are honoring one another. Right? So look that up, John 17. Um, I feel like I need to close pretty soon. Okay, so getting to the Trinity. The early church, so after the kind of the first generation of Christians, they're having to kind of figure out their belief system. Okay? They, the, the, the New Testament isn't like, here's the Constitution and here's what you believe. Right? It's a story, and it's a collection of letters, and they're, they're having to live out their faith. And a lot of them, you know, there's various levels of education, and they're being persecuted from different angles. They're figuring it out. And, uh, and so they, they had certain things that they would say, like the baptism formula, where they'd say, okay, I baptize you and the Father, and the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They, and then pretty early on, they developed what's called the Apostles' Creed, which was a basic statement of belief. They had other things like certain phrases that they would just repeat. But um, they, they believed in the divinity of Christ. They believed in the divinity of the Holy Spirit and, and of God the Father, but they didn't quite like, I don't know, it takes time for these things to develop, the understanding of the Trinity. Um, and so um, one, of the, one of the criticisms of the Trinity is that it, it wasn't, formally like agreed upon until the 300s all right so we get to 325 after emperor constantine becomes the emperor of rome and he becomes well at least sympathetic to christianity probably became a christian but he at least like accepts christianity as a legitimate religion 
and he protects Christians, then Christians can actually come together and, like, all of them come together and make a decision. Like, what do we believe? And let's all decide and let's write it down. And let's, you know. Um, and so that's when they make these declarations, but they already believed it. It's just kind of like, let's come together and let's say, here's what we believe. We all agree on it. Good. Um, because there were these heresies that came up. So the... Uh, so they knew what they believed, um, but then they had to start like defending themselves against heresies. So, so what are some ways? There's another interaction point. Um, what are some ways that we can rep the God could be misrepresented? That and in the early early days, there was a lot of ways, a lot of different ideas about Jesus, about um, about God, about the Spirit, like different ways that He was spoken about. I got Ryan over here in the nosebleeds. What do you think? A way that God could be misrepresented. Okay, modalism, right? Okay, so some people take on, there's this concept of oneness theology, and that they I mean, you say, okay, let's stick to the idea that God is one and not believe in three persons, but that he can have different modes Okay, I can, I can be the Son, or I can be the Father, or I can be the Spirit. Does that make sense? One person, one God, not three persons, but that one God can have different forms or modes. So some people believe a oneness theology, because God is one, and he can come and manifest himself in different modes. Right? And so they're trying to, trying to have monotheism without the trinity and it gets messy right it's weird if jesus is in the garden praying to the father but he is the father so who is he talking to right and if and if jesus is if there's only if there's only one person in the godhead and, and god dies what happens <laughs> God's in the grave for three days. And who raises him? I don't know. Anyway, so there's a lot of big questions that come up if in, that, in that idea. Thanks, Ryan. So what, what about, what, are there any other ideas about, like, what are ways that it can be misrepresented? He doesn't want a relationship. He doesn't want a So that'd be like deism. Created, and I'm just over here, and I don't care about you. Right? Yeah. Any other thing, ideas? Okay, uh, so it's, there's one idea that Jesus was um, Jesus was born as a normal person, and then God kind of deified him, and he said, "Oh, I like this guy. I'm going to make him divine." Yeah, that doesn't work either, right? Um, so there's a lot of different ways. Okay, so the question is, so what? What difference does the belief in Trinity make in your life? And this will, we'll wrap it up with this. Um, what do, you, what do you think? What difference does it make? Every. Every difference. <laughs> What's one, Jabbar? Uh, Judaism versus Islam versus, I mean, they really all boil down to these very questions. Okay. Uh, I think the biggest difference is that... <clears throat> Yeah. And without believing that Jesus is the only way, you will never receive the Holy Spirit to reveal that truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of really a question within a question of why is it that we get it and nobody else seems to get it? Yeah, because it, yeah, it, it, it seems foolishness to anybody else, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, what else? What other things can we learn that develop us as, as believers in Christ because we understand and we believe the Trinity? Yep. huge to me. This is just like, wow, because I'm raised Catholic. Oh. I've known these things inside, but get this actual scripture. Mine is really ecstatic. Good. Because I have a son that needs to be straightened out on this because he believes in this world and stuff. And, oh, we're all God. We're all created to be like God. And oh, children. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was raised for life, but he had some serious traumas in his life. Mm. So basically for me, this idea of humility mm. and honoring each other and the love. And then, you know, the Muslims, that's why they're coming to Christianity in, in thousands, because they have no love in their culture. Mm. 
That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, so so we are we are creating His image, and if we're image bearers of God, then we, and we and that's something we talked about earlier. We can know Him, and we can be in relationship with Him, and we're better images if if we know who we're imaging, um, right? We know who we're reflecting, so therefore we can better image Him to the world, and so understanding the Trinity creates us better images and better reflections of him okay um Uh, yeah, that's. I think that's helpful. Thanks, Austin. Um, and that relates to this third thing I have was like we we we, did, we see relationships and unity and community, right? And so what you're talking about of a herd, right? If we're one church, we're a body of Christ. God desires for us to be united, and and so as a united body of Christ, like the Trinity, like the Father, Son, and the Spirit are united. Um, we can better represent him in this world, right? And so if we have a perfect unity as a family, as a, as a community, then um, and we're in relationship like God the Father is in relationship and he desires relationship with us and he desires unity within the body. So often the idea of a herd and like God is directing this and sometimes wayward group and all in love, right? Sometimes he has to discipline those that he wants to shepherd back in. But all in love, and he's directing us on a path and a journey together. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then as we talked about how God is love, and we can re represent him by being loving. And then um, in the humility. So the humility of the Trinity. And how, like, deflecting glory. And, you know, good leaders... If they're praised, they're always going to say, you know what, my team is awesome. You know, all these people that made this happen. And, and so it's the, it, you, you kind of wish that politicians would recognize that, like, if they would just show some humility and deflect, yeah. like, you know, okay, fine, but, you know, I all of the staff and all these people that write my speeches or do the research or... And help me out with all this stuff. Like, I, I'm not a one man show, and so they, they pretend like they are. Um, but anyway, but same with pastors. A lot of pastors, like, hey, it's me on stage, but there's so many people behind him. And if he never deflects the glory and the praise, then, um, you know, there's, there's not this community and this humility that is demonstrated in God. Okay, that can be it, unless you have any questions. <laughs> Um, I know people have a million questions probably in their minds right Yeah. We, will, we can, because uh, there's a lot of people watch online. Yep. Still can do it with the virus. We could, uh, I could ask you to send questions to Janelle. And yep. maybe next week or before by the study. Yeah. We'll 
good. All right, so I know this is a lot. Um, as I said at the beginning, I kind of gave this like caveat or what was it, a warning? Um, you know, it's just a, it's a big topic and like whole books and courses and everything have been done on this. And, and so in and, and trying to boil it down to something and, and I, you know, it's hard to do. So I hope you're able to follow that. And if you have any questions, please ask Jabbar or me or somebody. And we might not know the answers, but maybe we can help figure it out. Um, but I think the, the core of it is God has revealed himself as Father and his Son and his Holy Spirit, yet there's one God. And, um, and we have to hold to that truth, even though it is a bit of a mystery and it's beyond us, ultimately. And that's where faith comes in hand, right? So we walk in faith, believing this to be true, and believing that he's, he's revealed himself in this word, and, um, and that the Holy Spirit's here to help us along the way. So uh, I'll pray. Lord God, I thank you for this time that we had together. I hope that your truth was conveyed and that your spirit was uh, leading hearts um, as we read a lot of passages and, and had a lot of conversation. Lord, I pray that uh, we all go out in desiring to be, to represent you um, as your image bearers, as God, you are loving, you are humble, um, even as God, you desire our praise, you deflect it, and, um, and so we want to glorify you even more. So help us to, uh, to live in community, to, uh, to love others, and, uh, and just to remember the truths that we know about you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Is Daniel a great teacher or what? Oh, yeah. okay. Everybody who comes here regularly know that I would have never, I would have, I'd have ran off on so many side notes about five, six different times. I would have made it even a third of the way through that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a deep topic. Uh, can everybody, I, me and Daniel have known each other for, his wife calls, says we have a bromance going. <laughs> we, we do. I, I really do love him like my brother. And, and uh, I, my gift, uh, my strongest gift is to see the gifts of others and to encourage and exhort people to walk in everything that God has for them. And I, I, he's so fun. We, we spent a significant amount of time talking, so it's obvious that he was a gifted teacher um, because it has a great deal to do with not the words that Daniel is saying, but the gift empowers the words that God has given him by revelation. That is the difference. Only God can do that. School can't do that, seminary school can't do that, a PhD can't do that, being an author can't do that. It, only the hand of God can do that. So can we give Daniel a hand for his amazing job? That's a very tough, tough topic to handle, a very tough one. So the way my gift works is as soon as he got to the question, that's like I wanted to jump up and like, yeah, I'll take it from here, this is what. Uh, <laughs> But Saints, I, I just want to say, leave you with one thing. It was so good what he said about the Trinity reflects the mirror. So Jesus says that we look in the we walk away from the mirror and we forget who we are. What he's saying is, is that if we are if we walk away from the mirror and we don't, we are no longer the reflection. So essentially, if we leave here this afternoon. And we go out into the world. And if we only in here are acting a certain way, believing a certain thing, but then when we get out in the world, if we are not reflecting to humanity the fullness of the Trinity through love, patience, kindness, I mean, God exerts his, shows his love in many different ways. Then Jesus is saying, then you really don't know me. <laughs> if you're walking away from the mirror, Thus, if we leave here today, and that's okay, but we sometimes we just need to acknowledge to God that, Lord, why is it when I leave service, why is it after Bible studies, why is it after prayer, I go out into the world and I seem to no longer reflect you the way that I want to? 
And a lot of the time, it is just because we don't allow him to. <laughs> he's, he's willing and able, but we have a thing called pride in our fallen nature. And that's where the regeneration has to happen. And the regeneration is partially the rejoining to God through the sacrifice of Christ. The separation, we are rejoined to him, thus the regeneration. And that allows the renewing of the mind. So, Father, I pray that we do not leave here unchanged. That we allow this teaching uh, to pose questions, deeper questions. <laughs> Father, we have an opportunity that no other belief system has. We have the helper. That is the difference. And the helper reveals the son that continually reveals the father. Lord, that is the sole difference. It's not that we haven't, and I haven't met wonderful people, seemingly, Lord, that don't believe in Jesus, but they simply, without the Holy Spirit, cannot operate in the fullness of obedience. The Holy Spirit teaches us to do exactly what you want us to do. And that is where the Father is revealed. That is where the many-breasted one, the nourisher, is revealed. That's when the peacemaker is revealed and the war maker. And Father, even for this young man that spoke earlier, I pray, Lord, that you show even a deeper revelation of your love. You don't have to punish. Sin is self-revealing. Sin punishes itself. It brings forth death. You don't have to do anything. Those who are in sin bring condemnation upon themselves. You are not a condemning God. You are a loving God. And everyone has an opportunity. So Lord, I pray that we just receive more of your love, more of your grace through your son, more of the helper to understand your son, which will, out of love, we worship you. Out of your kindness, we give you adoration. Out of your blessings, we serve. So Lord, give us a deeper revelation of the fullness of the Trinity. In Jesus' name, amen. So saints, we do a, a, a kind of like potluck deal. It's not mandatory. Nothing here is mandatory. <laughs> uh, so you're welcome to hang around. Sometimes people make some amazing dishes. So even if you want to eat somewhere else, you might want to go peek over there and see if, I mean, there's some amazing things that people make. Uh, but that's where we try to, instead of everybody rush, rushing off in their own direction, where we try to get to know each other, uh, break bread with one another, and just enter in a fellowship. So thank you for coming today. Did you ask brown kids? I've been baptized in both yeah. directions. <laughs> in the name of Jesus and in the name I, of the Father. Usually it's my kids and Daniel's kids. So we're like, that's that, like the whole That is the one I grew up in. Oh, so that's the Really? Um, you brought them back? Why? The one year old's in there too? Why then? Did, 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 God's name is uh, Ethos. Uh, uh, there's there's different names of God that are revealed in the Old Testament.